We're about to broadcast, and here we go. Three. Hello, everybody. How Hello. are you doing out there? Hello. Hey. hey. Oh, look at those numbers like, go up. Yep, Sorry for yep. the slight delay. I had to kind of get my hair in gear. You know, we had to, we kind of, kind of make ourselves all well and, and set for this particular session. Um, as people are rolling in, we're counting the participant count because it's very important that we are. Uh, we have all uh, agreed to donate one US dollar for every participant that comes to this session. So uh, between the four of us, we can kind of casually look at that number and see what's the top number it does get to. So mm -hmm. at least we can either screenshot it or keep it for, for reference. So. For those of you who are wondering who the big talking head is right now, my name is Robert Scrobe. I am the person behind the Global Virtual Design Sprint and Dallas Design Sprints here in Dallas, Texas, where no one's outside and everyone's indoors, either playing games or wondering when they're going to go outside again. And also with me on the call is our two people from a, a company called Just Mad. We have, and I'm going to try to say your names right, so please correct me. It's, it's Raz, <laughs> Ber, is it Berkew? Is it, do I pronounce it that way? It's Burchu. Burchu. Raz Burchu. Okay. Yes, totally He's the co-founder. Awesome. Yeah, I'll get it right eventually. I just say it <laughs> enough. And Anna Orga? Warga. Okay. Yeah, I'm terrible. Really <laughs> Co-founders of Just Mad. Raz and Anna. Yeah, yeah. Raz and Anna from Just Mad. We also have Andre from, he's the co-founder of Deep Work Studio and the ever popular and always exciting and amazing Sandy Lamb out there in Leipzig, Germany. Hopefully I said that right. <laughs> from Software AG. All of us, all five of us, uh, did some sort of webinar about a couple of weeks ago called Remote Facilitation Best Practices. And this is part two, where we are pretty much going to hold a massive Q&A session to answer your questions about remote facilitation and design sprints and everything else in between. There's a lot of brain power on the call and we're gonna try to get through as many questions as we can. Uh, if you wanna follow along, I'm gonna be sharing a, a mural uh, board that Sandy was kind enough to create so that we can walk through everything. And uh, as we're going through this, uh, just for the panel, are we going to be sharing out the link to the mural so that people want to get into the the um, the mural right now to put post some questions? Are we going to put that to everyone that's that's kind of listening in? Because I can put it over on YouTube as well. Mm -hmm. I think we already see some people asking for that. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. And also just want to make a note. Uh, I see a lot of people are writing in the chat, but they just sent it to the all panel list and saying hi to everyone. So I think they actually meant to send it to everyone. Uh, so you need to switch that option to uh, all panelists and attendees. Okay. Yep. We could do that. Um, so uh, I know that the popular thing to do on these calls is to kind of say where you're from, but I think another thing I'd like to do beyond where you're from is like, where do you want to go on vacation once this uh, freaking pandemic is pretty much done? Where do you want to go? Like, it's like, okay, I've been in the living room <laughs> with my family, my kids. I want to go to X. So go ahead and put in in the chat as a way of saying hi, where you are going to go on vacation come the fall when this is all said and done. So nice. Ireland Dallas, is one. Texas. Berlin, <laughs> Mom and I are going to Las Vegas. Las Vegas seems to be like Dallas, Texas. Yep. There you go. I, I'm with you, Soul. What? Croatia. Dallas for vacation? <laughs> <laughs> France. France. Yeah, France is popular. Antwerp, cilantro, Barce they want Barcelona. Some people don't want to leave to the sea. Okay. I'm imagining somebody on a boat going, I just want to stay isolated in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> I'll, stay, I'll stay here. I'm sending the kids away. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Panama. Cool. Oh, so nice. Paris. All right, so we got a lot of locations, so we're all set. All right, so the, how this will work is that um, for the benefit of everybody, I will uh, be sharing my screen so you can see the mural board from where you are. Um, uh, we have we shared out the um, have we shared out the the anonymous link to everyone yet? I may have not seen that in the chat since it's been scrolling out, but um, I'll go ahead and put it in there if we haven't. Uh, do, 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 Will do, you do, do that, Robert? I have it handy if you. I got it. We're good. Oh. Right. So let me go ahead and minimize these windows and maximize the one that we're supposed to be paying attention to. Um, and then we'll be good to go. Enter full screen. There seems to be, should be like a dramatic music that happens in Chrome when you do that. That would probably <laughs> make it. <laughs> yeah. Like dun dun dun. 
All right, so we're at 105. Let's go ahead and share out. Where is it? There you go. Nope, not that one. Oh, I know why. It's uh, because I have the window that I'm sharing maximized and Chrome tends to hide it when I do. There we go, okay. Boom. Nice. So once again, uh, we are doing this as part of a charity endeavor to donate a dollar for everyone who attends this Q&A uh, for the COVID-19 Solidarity Response Fund for the World Health Organization, um, an organization that's very, very near and dear to its brand, as we found out. So what you want to do when you're in this is go down into the questions area and start filling in uh, some questions for either one of us or these two columns here are for uh, any of us to basically answer at some point. Um, and I think uh, Sandy, Anna, uh, Raz, and Andre, what might be fun to do is once these questions start populating here and, and for, for the, for, oh, I forgot to add, if there's space, you can go ahead and add uh, cards right below, like copy and paste one of these cards and put them below somebody else's name or in there if you wanna continue on. But at some point, I think it might be kind of fun to use uh, Mural's native tools and have people use their mouse cursor to kind of put their mouse over a particular question they'd like us to answer. So yeah. that instead of doing them like either horizontally or vertically based on name, we can say, okay, next question. Then anyone who's paying attention as an anonymous rabbit or a shark or a goat can basically take the mouse and kind of move it over a particular question they'd like to have answered. So in a way, it's kind of like um, heat map. It, yeah, it's kind of like like using the the wisdom of crowds to kind of figure out where we should put our our um, our collective uh, attention. So, um, is everybody set on the panelist side? Should we do introductions before we get started, or did I already do that? I already did that. Okay. Um, yeah. So, how would you like to uh, panelists? How would you like to start this? Would you, we just want to go to the first question in the very corner and kind of go from there? Yeah. Yeah. We'll yeah. Go for that. We can All right. That. Okay, so I'm gonna zoom in a little bit and start over here on the on the, the upper uh, left. Robert, one quick yeah. thing. Someone uh, says I signed yeah. up but can't get in or here as told that the meeting is full, so yeah. I got kicked I, out. I also got a message on LinkedIn. Really? I was okay. just wondering. The attendees are at 101 since. Mm -hmm. yep. So 100. I it, So this is weird. I upgraded it two days ago. And oh, I'm yeah. wondering if that upgrade didn't attach itself to the existing uh, remote, like the existing yeah. events, like awesome. it didn't go into that. Hmm. Our, our hmm. inbox is, is I, I also got like four <laughs> messages that people can get in. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. All right, so, so, that leaves us, so that leaves us with a quandary. Um, what we could do is we could shut this session down and start a new one and then basically can bring everyone back into it, which would kind of be a bit of a hiccup, or we can continue on with where we are now. So what do we do? Because this is something unexpected on the Zoom side where I thought once you upgrade, you just basically applies to what you're doing. Well, the interaction is on Mural anyway, I think, right? So, and this, yeah. we're streaming this to YouTube. So wouldn't, okay. like, I, I guess we're doing this anyway. And yep. do you have a chat in YouTube open? That's the only thing that we can catch yeah, I'll but, go ahead and basically go in there and, uh, and make that change. Okay. I think it doesn't make sense canceling this one. Just probably yeah. direct people to the YouTube stream. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Okay, so let me pause this one and then I'll just basically put in the questions for that. So lesson learned with Zoom. They don't necessarily upgrade everything that you have existing on your schedule with the upgrade <laughs> that you do to that. Yay. <laughs> Okay, so then we'll have to we'll have to kind of improvise on the on the amount that we're going to be donating and do it based on like a different number. Um, but give me one yeah, second, and fine. I'll go ahead and take care of the YouTube side of things. Cool, um, thank you. And then, yeah, I ah, cool. The mural is also in the chat. Okay, so whoever wants to see the questions, can you please paste me? The link. Yeah, hold on. Let me just grab this real quick. Yeah, I'm gonna do the same. Thank God it's just two hours, eh? Now we are giving all the people the time to actually write down their questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in a way it's it's uh it's a silver lining to the whole thing. Okay. Feel free to add more sticky at the bottom if um you're running out of space. 
Yeah, or just basically, uh, you know, put it all over the rocket ship. At this point, it's one of those things where you just have everyone move in. <laughs> yeah, just make it messy. Yeah. Yes. I create a mural and I like things to be organized in some way, but um, don't <laughs> try to keep it as organized. Like because when we do workshop, we often just you mess everything up. So that's totally fine if you want to do that. Yeah, and this is on me. So uh, the funny thing is, is that we all kind of invested before the upgrade to the, the the webinar in anticipation of having all these people kind of come in. And lo and behold, there was a little snafu with kind of re you know actually taking everything down and bringing everything back up. So mm -hmm. yeah. All right. What I can do also is that maybe this is something that I can I can contact Zoom about, and they can basically like on the fly. Mm -hmm. up make this larger so maybe what i can do is i'll kind of go in the background and try to do some troubleshooting um and then you guys all of you can basically like start tackling some of the questions here so okay. i'll start things off with uh the first one that's right here when, and i'm gonna highlight it with a little bit of cooler oh wait <laughs> a minute so it's, the first question is, is you, if you were to partner with any professional to co-facilitate a remote virtual session, who would it be and why? <laughs> and Ros and Anna, that's, that's not a, that's that's not a game a, show a, question. <laughs> <laughs> that's not an intro question. The whole world. Yes. That's brilliant. Hmm. The whole world becomes co-facilitators co in one big remote virtual session. <laughs> That's my well, maybe a, maybe a variation of this question is is that who do you find if you had to co-facilitate um, would would complement you very well? Mm -hmm. That's a very great answer. A plus, it it really depends on the team. So, for example, if you're the designer or if you're the scrum master or the PM, who else can join in and help you out with facilitating a remote session? Yeah, I think anyone yeah, anyone sorry. in the panelists. I'll be more than <laughs> happy to oh, co-facilitate with any of yes. you. Likewise, I, I also I, think, I also agree on that. Sorry, Sandy. Yeah, I, I was just going to say like I think it depends on the workshop format and all that. But sometimes I actually like to involve someone who is very new in facilitating, but they want to uh, practice it and mm -hmm. give them the chance. I think that sometimes it, it, it's just a lot of people they they feel like it's they don't they're, they're afraid to actually take the facilitation role and then never want to try to do it but then i like to actually involve them that way so mm -hmm. rob um do you have the youtube link sorry for your yeah hang on i'll go ahead and do that get that to you <laughs> awesome. Ooh, my son is so right i think eyes. i have a i think i do have a solution i'm working on a, a workaround so give me a minute I think I may have found a, a way of getting it to work. So give me a minute. I, ha I also have like one situation where co-facilitation has actually uh, been important with with um, drawing out a storyboard in a sprint. Like if you if you draw that for like four hours, like in person that takes four hours, but it's also quite important if you do it remotely that you kind of share tasks. So mm -hmm. on one hand, you know, you would always have some one person that's the scribe, that's like from the book, yeah, and one person who's like the the moderator. And if you, we had a we had a good experience in switching roles throughout these four hours, because it just gets so mentally taxing and so incredibly uh, difficult that it really makes sense. If you if you have someone who's comfortable with projecting your thoughts onto a whiteboard, that's the person for that. <laughs> Great call. Um, we just thinking about a name, like an actual person who I think it would be an amazing pleasure for me to actually co-facilitate something with. That would be Lizette Sutherland. Mm -hmm. She's the author of Work Together Anywhere. Uh, she's an incredibly, incredibly kind person. And it's just a pleasure talking to her. Absolutely. And I, I'm, I'm imagining as a remote facilitator, like an expert in the field, it's, a, it's an amazing experience to get a chance to work with her on, on something tangible. What do you think are valuable soft skills that she has? The Just valuable so soft skills? Or like, in t because you say she's a person that's very pleasant to talk to. Yeah, I mean, just, just 
I would even go to the level of the like the tone of her voice and the way she articulates an explanation. Mm -hmm. Like it, it's it's kind of like the the Morgan Freeman voice that kind of narrates <laughs> something, and it's 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 oh, wow. really it's really soothing. Lizette, if you're hearing this, I, um, it, it it really is nice, and we actually talked to her, and we have a webinar with her in two days, and it's just so nice to kind of coordinate with her on these things. So I think that would be amazing mm -hmm. to to see. Awesome, I made yeah. it in. Oh, nice. I'd love to facilitate with Morgan Freeman. <laughs> Morgan Freeman. Or, or similar. <laughs> okay, okay. I guess that Morgan Freeman Should voice goes very well with the next question that we have in here. <laughs> so, what does remote facilitation look like in 2021? I would oh, definitely add that in here. <laughs> Morgan Freeman voice, <laughs> over. Remote facilitation in 2021. Can I take a stab at this? Go ahead. Um, I think everything that's going on right now is is pushing the entire the way we call it the remote revolution kind of pe people not being afraid to work remotely. I mean, up until now, people had a had a choice, but given everything that's going on, hey Robert, we're seeing your Zoom settings. Oh, my fault. Sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I think sorry, what it looks sure. like it's it's a more mature market. Like everything has to do with remote work, not just remote facilitation or remote work in general, basically got a boost. And um, it's going to be so much, you're, you're going to find remote work and remote facilitation so much more often, even in companies that have avoided it or did not adopt it until now. I think the acceptance towards remote uh, work will, will increase. Mm -hmm. People will understand that work can be done in such environments, even if you basically alternate. So you don't have to be fully remote, but you can be acceptant of remote work and figuring out that it's not going to reduce effectiveness and it's not going to impact your stock price or KPIs or whatever metrics you're looking at. And it, it can sometimes actually help it. I think that's, those are my two cents on the topic of the future of remote. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I think there will be a lot of principles that have been refined into every company that they can simply, more or less, if someone gets onboarded, these are the things you should do as a remote facilitator. And that will be much more clear than it is now. Mm -hmm. I think visual storytelling will play a huge part yes. next year. I guess that not only designers, every single person who facilitates a remote session should be able to create a visual summary of what they want to yeah. expand on during the session. So if I interrupt really fast, it uh, looks like I was able to get a workaround. It was a more expensive hey. option, but uh, now that that 100 uh, like thing is lifted. So people, if they're still hanging out or on YouTube at this point, they can still join um, so that we don't have to have that that artificial like 100, 100 things ceiling. So. Okay. Um, there you go. Awesome. And I'll work it out with Zoom after the call in terms of getting my money back so I don't have to spend a, a <laughs> ginormous account of what I did. So um, to kind of catch up, so we answered two questions. What I'll start doing is I'll start bringing down the, um, I'll start bringing down the answers into this bottom part here and, and start populating them in this section once we start answering them. So uh, like we had mentioned before, right before I realized that people couldn't get in because the house was full, if you see particular questions on here that you want us to answer after we get done kind of uh, talking about things, go ahead and put your mouse and kind of circle over the, the question in, in particular. Um, it could be anywhere in this, this mural, but go ahead and do that now. Let's kind of experiment and see. Um, we may see a bunch of squiggly uh, like arrows, but there are a couple of them that seem nice. to center on one particular one. We'll kind of go after that. Um, yeah, probably a good idea if I have everyone kind of like look at the same place. So. This is where we're kind of looking at, go ahead and put your mouse over something that you want us to answer. And it looks like the, the, everyone's on the next one in bold. It says, how do you, <laughs> that, that was easy. There's right. someone is like <laughs> drawing on it. Yeah. How do you ensure that people are not doing something else while they're on the remote team meeting with you? Man, I wish I, we had a button, you know, just to squeeze it <laughs> whenever we get the answer, <laughs> you know, calls dibs on the first question. So let's bring okay. this down. Dun, 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 dun. Um, oh, so we're moving. Okay. Somebody's moving the like the yellow stuff that I'm setting up here. Stop Maybe we can lock that. that. Yeah, better lock that. Deep burnt. Okay. So the question in, in uh, that's at, posed is how do you ensure people are not doing something else while they're on the remote team meeting with you? Um, so 
I can answer this, and my answer is you can't. <laughs> they are either going to be engaged or they're going. They're not going to. It's really, uh, it's really your responsibility to a make sure they understand the purpose of why they're there. Two. <laughs> that they have a clear idea of what this, what the objective is of everyone getting together and the outcomes you're after. Mm -hmm. And three, to make sure that you aren't scheduling a two hour online meeting without any sort of, um, without any sort of uh, like breaks or, or kind of rhythm to it. Agenda, mm -hmm. it some of the things that, that uh, are apply to real world meetings, apply to virtual meetings as well, or virtual get togethers. And some of them are, if you want to make sure that people are paying attention, have an agenda, have a, have a, a kind of list of things that people are going to be doing during that time. And it'll, it'll ensure that, that at least you have, you've been setting expectations around what people are going to be doing. Uh, but I don't think you can really enforce what people do. It, it's really, you, you can't go down that route. Um, the most you can do is make sure that you create the right environment for how people are going to be interacting. And um, that's, that's it. But if you try to force it and try to say you must have your camera on 24 seven, people are going to move in the opposite direction, typically, and they're going to reject the notion that they have to be in these in the first place, they'll find some excuse not to come. But I think that I think like, even if we can not force people, the way that we can uh, help it is to keep um, giving activities to people to do. So when they are actually doing things that they cannot really move on and doing something else in a way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also the other one that um, we learned was yeah. uh, 20 minutes, uh, every 20 minutes we try to do a, a, an easy not then vote. So or just a voting section doesn't need to be something that is um, with a decision on, but uh, just to give something that people will have something to do, it always helps. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. One. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Andrew. Uh, just real quick, I had a conversation with a friend this morning about this, and uh, we were talking about the fact that people are uh, used to go into a meeting and just sit and just don't do anything, and <clears throat> now, and I think it's important to think about this as an not as a challenge but as an opportunity we all get forced to actually do something. So what Rob, Robert mentioned was, I 100% agree with that, have an agenda, having an agenda, having a structure and letting everybody do something. And then, you know, the question is like, how do you make someone listen to you in real life? Yeah. <laughs> I think it all boils down to how you actually build up the team. Like everything has to do with preparation. Uh, great points, everyone. And kind of obviously having an agenda is, is super critical because if you're doing a, a workshop, you want to make sure that everyone has something to do. And when you build a team, the people that are going to be in the actual session, whether it's a meeting or a workshop, make sure you build, bring the right people in. Don't bring people that have nothing to say on that because they're obviously going to slag. They're obviously going to do something else. Right. So make sure everyone has and understands their role. Why am I here? Why do yeah. you block my calendar for this amount of time? And what do you need from me? And I think this is this is really important. And, and as a facilitator, you have to be aware of how you build your team. The same way, for example, when we do design sprints, we do interviews with probably 15 to 20 people, but only bring seven of them in a sprint because that's kind of like the, the acceptable number that is, is easy to manage. Yeah. And just as a, as a demo, um, I think the, the, having the camera on is really useful. I think it boils down to, you know, having a purpose in the meeting. So don't just join a meeting for the sake of it. Yeah. And you, you as a facilitator, you have to ensure that they will have something to do yeah. and they bring something on the table. So keeping them busy, obviously, <laughs> and having them tasks to achieve um, will keep them, you know, focused on what they need to do. Yeah. And one, one trick, this might not be like a super effective solution like this is going to solve engagement problems if you look at our faces right now if i'm tab switching you can obviously see the light bouncing on and off because i'm switching in between mural and netflix this is netflix <laughs> this is mural this is netflix this is mural and this is i know our camera might be over we are still exposed on netflix. but we're still on netflix yeah it's better um we, we've noticed that if people are distracted you can see it you can see it in in the way they interact with whatever exercise is going on right now. So if someone's doing something else or 
um, like if they're supposed to do kind of like a, a contribution exercise, where they need to talk about something and someone is kind of looking up and down at their keyboard, they're obviously typing to someone, whether that's Slack or Messenger or whatever, or if, if people are, are uh, unfocused or they don't understand what's going on, they might squint or might just, just uh, look away or feel confused. You can notice when someone's confused looking at their face. I think this is a, a, a nifty trick that we use because we co-facilitate almost every session that we do. And while someone is kind of like the lead facilitator, the others keeping tabs and making sure people are engaged and answering questions in the backstage if they have these questions. Yeah. It, it, it just comes down to expectations. It's yeah. you're going to you set the proper expectations of people do and they can uh, pretty much do what they want during the session, but it really comes down to what you the outcomes and what you want them to do. And you can reinforce them with a lot of the things that we talked about in just now in terms of like some things that we recommend. Um, but ultimately, the responsibility comes down to the person that's going to be attending the, the session to either contribute or be active. Um, Jeez. <laughs> circles on the actual nice. questions bold it's like the, you're almost trying to start trying to hack the system um <laughs> like you make it colors i'm actually expecting somebody and i'm not i'm not suggesting you do this but you actually take one question and you blow it up so it's like super huge that would be a little too disruptive but i do like the i do like the circles. so um the anonymous sea turtle has already started to kind of highlight something for Roz. So let's go down that road. So your circle question, Roz, is what's your take on when and how to use break rooms effectively? Okay, so um, we found this super effective. Uh, if, uh, Andre, uh, was it you or Sandy? I apologize. Uh, which one do we say that? Uh, try to have um, breaks in between the sessions. So if you have a two-hour session, make sure to schedule these breaks. And the break rooms are, are super effective. Uh, especially in times where people don't have anything else to do in between the sessions. Like when we do a design sprint and we have a full workshop day, it's not like we tell them, uh, okay, you can go ahead and work on something else because they're fully committed to whatever we're doing here. And it's like breakout rooms are, are a choice. Like if you want to go ahead and respond to a few emails while we're having a break, that's perfectly fine. If you want to just chill around and do kind of a water cooler environment, it's, it's super effective. But um, what we found is we always keep our sessions under two hours. We never kind of go with one session um, over the, the two hour mark. People get super disengaged. For example, in the sprint, when we do storyboarding, that's one of the, the hardest ones. Uh, we try to st strategically place like short, shorter breaks, maybe every, every hour or so. But again, it, it's also a matter of... Um, feeling the audience feeling the the people and and what their their current state is like if there's like a, a very intense conversation people can are really stuck and they need to get out you might just just uh whip out a, a breakout room just tell everyone hey let's just take five let's take a little time and then we'll reconvene and and start and on another interesting way of kind of refreshing the entire vibe of the the session is to do energizers like, again, if you feel that kind of momentum is slowing down and people are, are kind of um, disengaged, you could do a quick, um, like a, a quick I don't know, energizer exercise, just, just giving something to do really quick. I hope that answered the question. I also have a little, exp or sorry, is it okay if I add on to this? Or? Yeah. Andre, is your name Roz? What are you doing? No, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Sorry, because some of my questions. No, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, I, I had a, an experiment uh, with uh, breakout rooms during a sprint. And it turns out that if you like the problem with the breakout rooms is that they're not facilitated if you're the only facilitator. So if you let people go in there and work on uh, stuff on their own, they probably don't do it as well as if you would moderate that. Uh, so if you use breakout rooms and for a specific task, like if you have like a team of, I don't know, hundred people and you need to split them up into smaller groups. Uh, make sure that you give them something to do and you time box it so that by the end of that time, they'll have something to present and then it works well. Perfect timing for making a story. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Who's next? Um, let's go back up here and uh... I'm gonna turn back. I actually turned curses off so I can kind of look at what I was doing. Um, okay, 
So let's see here. The sea, tur <laughs> the sea turtle's already at it. Okay, I'll have everyone follow you. It's almost like he's, that's the sea turtle, whoever it is, is the first one to kind of move on something. Um, so again, let's do, let's do the, the wisdom of crowds to figure out where in this people would want to kind of put in their stuff. So I'm looking at, look at that other screen. You guys have to put your arrows on the questions. <laughs> the, things, the thing. All right, we got a, a cat, a shark, and a turtle all converging on this one. And this is another question for Roz. Now, you're the man of the hour right now, I guess. It is, what's the number one mistake most junior facilitators make when going remote? Man, you're getting all the cool questions. Yeah, right? So yeah, just, just everyone feel like it's not just, just me. So feel free to, to chime in. So what's the number one uh, mistake most junior facilitators make when going remote? <sighs> First of all, not understanding the differences of in-person facilitation and online facilitation. Everything that we talked about both in this session and the last one, all about what it means to prepare, right? Like various things change. When you have to prepare an in-person workshop, for example, you have to think about, okay, do I have enough sticky notes? Do I have voting dots? Uh, who's going to manage food? If, for example, you're doing a, a full workshop day and you have to arrange catering and all of that. It's, it's all about not understanding how to translate all of the associated activities. Um, the second one would be preparation and, and uh, kind of under, uh, undermining the value of doing a training for people to use a tool like Mural or Miro or whatever you're using for online collaboration. Uh, this is a mistake we've also done when we started uh, doing design sprints. We just assumed that everyone is familiar with a tool like this, but it, it turned out that it's not really true because people might be coming from uh, day jobs that don't require them to collaborate visually in something similar like we, we're designers we work in sketch and figma and we're like super familiar with like a zoom in zoom out uh, canvas we are familiar with drawing rectangles and moving stuff around and writing in boxes but people who are not doing this on a daily basis we we totally um revamped the way we do preparation for our sessions we always do like a 20 to 30 minute um tour of the tool and give people really uh uh, easy exercises the way uh, Robert did right at the beginning asking people where you want to go and what, what's your next vacation spot we kind of do something similar we might ask them find a, a, an animated gif or gif however the internet wants to call it that clearly um, outlines the person you were in a past life so kind of give them a chance to go ahead find a, a, a gif paste that into the board write their name right to it so just take them through some very very basic exercises that allow them to set up the tool, use the zoom in and out, add a sticky note, upload an image, just to the basics. And one, let me, uh, other things that junior facilitators. Time zones. And my, my, yes, not thinking about time zones. So uh, aligning and, and making sure that they don't schedule sessions only for their convenience, but also being mindful of uh, everyone else's joining. So for example, Robert, um, like, it's 11 a.m. when we started, but if we were to make it convenient for us and hold a session at, I don't know, 2 or 3 p.m. Um, Europe time or Germany time, it would have been way too early for Robert, w would it? So, <laughs> 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 well, it just depends on how late I'm up at night. So, you never know. so in fact, that probably be a lot more entertaining then than it would be now and probably would embarrass myself uh, like for, I don't know how long, but go, please continue your thought. No, that, that was it. So being mindful of, of everyone else's uh, time zone and, and location. So it's not like crazy hours that people join at. I can also quickly add to that because I actually did a little bit of a review session for a bunch of facilitators this morning. And there were a couple of things that I think to apply <clears throat> to a lot. And yeah, definitely things like preparation, especially in terms of te technological um how do you call it like use readiness logical flu readiness fluency mm -hmm. and um be patient with people i think it's very easy to get impatient with um with <clears throat> when you see like 10 different people and they don't follow instructions the way you thought they would um they just need a little bit of time and it's not your fault it's it's just the way that everybody's going into that situation so it's these things are completely kind of normal uh this sorry did you want to say something 
No, I was going to say, Roz, when you're, if you look at some of the ways I'm typing out your answers that you say, if I don't I document them properly, feel free to go back in those answer cards and change yep. what I type so that it's more clearly articulating what you thought. On it. Same with same thing with you, Andre. If I'm if I'm typing with fat fingers and just going like this while I'm trying to uh, translate what you're saying, then um, definitely oh, no do worries. correct it. Thanks. Okay. Um, no problem. Yeah, and then another quick thing, uh, and then I'm. I'm done for this, um, but it's I've I've seen that a lot of times that um, facilitators look up exercises online and they try to implement them right away into a workshop, and they sometimes don't work as expected. So they would either you know people would do something completely different and the or the result is completely different, and it's super important that you know exactly why you're doing the exercise and you communicate that to the team because that also drives engagement. If people understand why they're doing something, they'd be more likely to you know, contribute to it. And a lot of times uh, resources online don't show the best, best descriptions for exercises. And there's a lot of different exercises that you can do with a team and facilitate them. Um, but sometimes writers don't imagine someone actually doing it. And sometimes it's just not super clear. And um, so just as a kind of advice, you want to think about how that can look or try it maybe yourself first beforehand so that, you know, it actually works out when you, when you run the, the session. Um, and if you don't know, then feel free to try it and just kind of accept that it's going to, it might fail. Um, but I feel like these two things um, were most, most came most often when I, when I worked with uh, yeah. Facilitators that's actually the out. number one mistake like they are afraid to try it yeah yeah Definitely. but also a lot honest, of it is like... uh... go ahead no no finish it's fine no no please you have the floor <laughs> please continue <laughs> i was I, I was just saying just just be honest if it doesn't if it doesn't work out it's better it's better to be honest and say this might this might have a different result from what we expect or like this is the first time we're trying it rather than trying to stick to this is going to work we'll do it exactly this way because it wasn't the instructions um because that just creates more confusion okay there was a sneaky anonymous cat then i've been noticing this that that since the focus is down here we're answering questions somebody's been dropping question cards into this area so we're going to entertain just one of them since it was a sneaky cat and i like somebody who's doing a little bit of it's a little bit out of the ordinary. Uh, I guess this is for all of us. This one is from people that are new to digital whiteboard and are really intimidated. How can you support them? Sandy Lamb, you want to take this one? Sure. Um, I think one way, the easiest way is just to have very simple exercise for them to try it out. So before we even start the workshop or before we start the meeting or section, whatever, uh, get them on the board and then just give them an exercise. One of them, Robert and I like to do is just ask them to, uh, what is your favorite vacation spot or what's your favorite food? And then they can just grab a picture, um, use the mural tools, like there's a mural, um, in mural there's like a image search and people can just get the image, paste it on the board and then add stickies on it. Um, people, other people can comment, pull out um, some icons and stuff like that. So then it just has very easy ice breaking exercise that actually get them on using the tool. The other one is um, per se, like if you're having a bigger workshop, what I would suggest is also have a one-on-one -on -one section before it actually starts, just to get everyone um, <laughs> pizza. <laughs> just to get everyone uh, get used to the thing and then make sure they know how to use the tool and if they need any help and just walk them through it one-on-one, uh, -on -one, so. Yeah. Or small group sessions, is that would be accurate? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, kind of have like a small kickoff on board section, on boarding section. Okay. Anyone else have any additional thoughts? By the way, um, to the panelists, I have an idea. Since we have so many people that are in mural right now, what if we, uh, at the top of the hour, getting close to it, what if we posed uh, a couple of questions for the audience? And then we use uh, murals native voting tools and see what people thought what the best answer could be. 
Do you want to try doing that at some point? Ooh, sounds, sounds good. Fun. All right. So we'll answer a couple more on our side. And then from there, we'll, uh, we'll turn it back to the people that are in the session and paying attention so they can actually experience the whiteboard and see where things go. Because um, it looks like people are already experimenting with it. <laughs> um, OK, so I'm going to put this question over here. This is, this is another uh, one that we'll go into a little bit later. I will go back up here and look at the <laughs> creative right. voting dots. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, Sandy, since you've been, uh, you know, there hasn't been one for you, especially with the voting dots. We're going to do one right here. It says, Sandy, how did you get so good at making mural boards? I know the answer to this. <laughs> Why don't you go ahead and, uh, and explain to everyone else how you became uh, as good as you did with the mural boards? Well, I think the biggest way you, or the easiest way you can do is draw GZDS, which is the global virtual design sprint. <laughs> so then you are forced to make a lot of mural boards and in a very short time and just, just keep using it. But like, in, honestly, I just, I just have been using it for many, many hours. I think I am the, like the highest uh, user in the whole Europe or something, according to Miro. <laughs> so <laughs> I've been putting a lot of hours on this. <laughs> That's what I'm going to say. Yeah. <laughs> it really, it really came down to practice. Like you did uh, templates. It, it's really like putting the time in to understand and master the tool. It would be a good way of putting it. Yeah, and the other is like. I think it's not just for mural. I think for any kind of tools, what I normally do is I just keep clicking on things, even though I don't know what they're trying to do. So I just, I yeah, I, my point of view is like, I can never break this. So it doesn't matter if I just keep trying it, so yeah. Um, what are some things that you've discovered in mural that it you wouldn't have known about unless you had done a lot of, uh, you had done a lot of, um, usage of it like some things that you discovered along the way from like a uh, simple like a basic user to a more advanced one yeah there are a few different ones that is very awesome and the one that i just just realized that uh is how you can so at the beginning i already said i like the mural board to be very organized and it freaks my, me out when there are like different sizes of sticky notes and stuff like that so let me just demonstrate here and I'm going to uh, summon everyone to the bottom. So for example, like if I have two stickies here and they are different sizes, all I need to do is just select them all. And then there you will see a toolbar and then on the other, uh, there's one icon and then you can just say resize to the biggest or resize to the smallest. And it will make all the stickies the same size. And that's something that I really, really like. And I just recently discovered that. The other so, thing that I really, sorry, yeah. Go no, go for it, finish, finish what you were thinking. Uh, yeah, the other thing that I uh, really like is how you can uh, arrange the sticky notes. So like, let's say you see like all these sticky notes here on top, like they are not really properly aligned and not the same spacing or something. Uh, let me take them here. So I select the whole row. I don't know if you actually see me because I'm not sharing my screen. Maybe Probably Robert, not. We can do that. We, yeah, we can't see the sub things, but um, I can do it so on my end. What I want to so yeah. So I just want to say that like you can select a few different messy sticky notes and then just uh, hit the arrange tool and then you can make them into a grid or organize them into types, um, something like that. So, yeah. yeah, by type, by row, column integrate. If you're looking at the share, either on YouTube or on in Zoom, um, I'm just kind of showing the the different options you can do. Uh, but Mural will automatically space those. In fact, uh, Sandy, now sometime between now and the next hour, why don't you find that? Um, was it was it a, a YouTube video or was it something where you had your top tips in Mural, like with some things that you had done? Um, it was some content you had created a while back for for yeah. kind of understanding how to go it, through it. It's um, one of the old ones that I was just thinking to redo that video. But <laughs> yeah, but you could I put can. it in here if, if you have time. It's like in terms of like sure. putting a resource over there. Okay, yeah. so let's take one more question up here and then we'll go into a kind of a group answer on some of these things. So okay. <laughs> every time I come up here, I don't know what I'm gonna expect now. So yeah, people are using voting dots. Um, I'll go ahead and highlight this one since we answered this. Um, 
and it says this one is <laughs> look at this jeez <laughs> all right there's uh, a heart on the dot <laughs> i know i saw that uh so this is for everybody it says what advice would you give to a rookie that will hold their very first design sprint ever next week and not and not now has to do it remotely okay okay bring this down so that it doesn't have all the collections of dots so we can isolate it a bit um and bring it down a little bit i, I love the font but i'm going to go back to a standard one so that we're all kind of seeing the same thing mm -hmm. okay this actually isn't a sticky note i think it's like a square but let me summon everyone over here through the mural superpowers and do this so anyone would like to answer this one what advice would you give to a rookie that will hold the very first design <laughs> <laughs> I guess Raz was fast enough. <laughs> to paste there. Well, that just so happens we have to have some content that is relatively new from Just Mad that basically is a four part series on how to run your very first remote design sprint. And by the way, not only do I like the use of the bananas in the videos, but also like the entertainment sections throughout the entire thing. Uh, I will you. also say, as an advocate for this series, it was when I first saw it, I thought, okay this could be like the start of a lot of different content you guys can produce. And I think you guys are, I've already said that to you both. So yeah, if you want to get an idea of what this is of how to do your first remote sprint, this is probably your, your first best bet in terms of like something that's interactive and on a video side. Um, so yeah, I think that effectively answers the question. Andre and Sandy, do you want to, um, do you have any advice for somebody who's first starting out with this and is probably going with, I think the, the the capitalization of ever probably gives an indication they're like, ah, and they don't know what to do. So, uh, what would you say to to them? Uh, yeah, I, I would say the same. I I think they should look at the videos and um, just might also produce this uh, step by step instruction. I think it's like clearer than any other instruction on the internet. Even mine. <laughs> no, no, so, uh, I would not say so because I remember, I remember when we met in Berlin and talked about this, and uh, we're going to be completely honest here. Andre and Andre kind of um, inspired us to explore this area better because he's mm -hmm. like the first people that we've ever found that talked about remote design sprints. <laughs> that's, so that's, that, that's very nice of you. Um, thank you. And, and, and I think everyone here has their contribution to the remote design sprint world. Exactly. With Robert and Sandy with the yes. uh, global design virtual design sprint, which is amazing. So, yeah. So one Definitely. thing I will, but one, one thing I will mention about Andre's uh, material, especially on Medium. Uh, I don't know if I told you this a long time ago. There's two things. One, I thought it was super cool that you use Dr. Dre as your as your avatar on Medium, and that actually <laughs> his name is also so Andre. Craig with me beyond, and I thought, okay, not only does he have attitude, he knows what he's talking about. And two, outside of what was being posted for physical in-person sprints, what you had posed in terms of showing and telling about your experience with remote sprints was a foundation for me to get to make an argument for it in the very beginning. So the kind of like the the schedule events you had posted in terms of when things happen versus when they don't started my own thinking around, well, maybe you don't have to do it by the book. You can actually break it apart and do it so that it works in an online environment. So I have to tell you that it started this entire thinking around or one of the pieces of evidence that started that entire thinking around doing it. There it is right there. Somebody just put it right next to the the, the one that's, right there. Yep, that's, that's over there. That's very, so. very nice of you. It's so, true. I mean, it shows it in the preview part, and literally you wrote it out like there, but it 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 started the conversation about how remote design sprints are fundamentally different than in-person ones in terms of how you schedule things out, how you graph it out. And, uh, you know, Raz and Anna's video also shows that graphically in terms of how to break things up. So um, it should, both of those are excellent resources. So, yeah. If that for whoever rookies out there, that's definitely what you want to kind of look at that. Yeah. And then you got the the thing I'm doing in May, but I don't like to promote that because you know it's just there. No, you also did a lot we'll of promote really good that. Work. We'll promote yeah. that. Okay. If you want to practice, work. that's the best way to do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. It's yeah. the whole point. It's just we were just getting together so you could practice actually doing it. Even if you don't know what the hell you're doing or you you're really, really scared about doing virtual sprints and making mistakes. That's an environment where you can just go crazy and it'll be fine. Well, you don't want to go crazy on the call. You don't want to like go like yeah. Tourette syndrome on everybody, but you know, it's a good place to do it. Um, so 
let's do an experiment here and see if we can crowdsource some of these. So I'm going to turn on my cursors here so I can see what everyone's pointing at. And my, uh, actually, my, my uh, advisor here is coming in to say hi. Um, what I want to do is, if you're currently looking at the question set, and I'm going to go ahead and summon everyone here um, to what I'm looking at, uh, go ahead and put your mouse over a particular question that you might want to answer from a crowdsource perspective. And uh, we'll pull it down and pull it down towards the bottom and see where we can go. So, um, so here's one down here, if I could. There's, and I'll kind of zoom in on it. It looks like we're going to take this one where it says, what are your best uh, ice breaking games for remote workshops? So mm -hmm. give me a minute. I'm going to take this one. And I'm going to come down here to all the answers. Hi. <laughs> By the yeah. So, do you want to introduce yourself to the world, or you just want to stay hid? Okay. <laughs> hey, this is the luxury of working at home. This is what this is just what happens. So, okay. So I'll move everyone over here. Um, Sandy, is this entire background gray? Is that is that's the graphic, correct? Uh, yes. Okay. So I won't I won't fool with that too much. Um, Bye. Also, my name's Alden. <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet you, man. Yeah, he's good. Okay. Uh, give me one second. I'm almost done. So maybe this is a good way of showcasing what to do on the fly when you are kind of improvising. Oops. So nobody move. <laughs> That's not going to work, obviously. OK, so if I'm going to summon everyone to where I'm at to kind of show you what I'm doing. So what I'm do essentially doing is I'm creating an environment here with digital cards to start answering the question around putting the time in. Oh, not that one. What did I do? Where is the question I was supposed to put? Uh, da -da -da -da. The Amatrizer, right? Yeah. Um, there you go. Mural did not copy that. Not Mural's fault, but sometimes that happens. Hang on, not too many yellow stickies. Hang on. Hang on a minute. Okay. So what we're going to do as a group is for some, I know some of you are on that are watching or kind of are in the online facilitation space or do have some ideas. But what you'd like to do is you're going to take this question, what are your best ice breaking games for remote workshops? And in these yellow stick, yellow digital cards here, I want you to double click on one of them if you're an anonymous animal and mm -hmm. put in some ice breaking games that you've done or experienced in remote workshops that you think work fairly well. Mm -hmm. um, we're, going to, we're going to give this about, let's say, three minutes to see what people come up with. I'll start the timer in Mural. Um, the panelists, can, you can go ahead and put in your suggestions as well. And after we get done with doing this, uh, we'll go through a voting session and see which ones have the most appeal with everybody. Mm -hmm. That sound good? Yeah. Now, this is also the opportunity to uh, be bold, be a little, nut, be a little crazy, uh, maybe even throw something in there that may be out of the ordinary that may seem appealing, but practical. Uh, but this is where, uh, usually as a facilitator, you try to encourage uh, thought that's a little outside the box so that we can get some ideas where it may not be exactly where it's supposed to be, but um, it'll give you a clue as to where you could go. Andre, now is your time to put on some music. I was about to ask, but um, the problem is if I stream music, then um, the YouTube stream, like you can't, you wouldn't be able to rewatch that again. Oh, because it filters it out. Oh, that's true. That is but very true. Uh... I tried it before, so I'm sorry. I actually I could put on right. uh, what is it? Uh, no, oh, I have a guitar damn. downstairs. You... Let me let me grab my guitar. I've got a minute forty five. <laughs> Hang on. Oh, you can just start singing there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Is anybody a good singer? Does anybody have a Morgan Freeman voice? <laughs> We need more Morgan Freemans, guys. <laughs> yeah, that's the problem um, with uh, yeah. music in workshops. It's it's amazing. I can only recommend that. I cannot recommend it enough to put on music. But if you're streaming it on YouTube, the algorithms catch it out and they tell you you can't use it. 
Mm. Just imagine some nice music. That's hard. Okay, one minute left. Someone said power posing. <laughs> That's amazing. Power posing. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> yeah, I can actually. Sh I don't know if that's if that's in place, but I um, yesterday, I'm always. What's the best way to stream music? Oh, that's a, by the way. Good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, that's that's equivalent of shouting out loud. <laughs> yeah. Um, you use Spotify, and then in Zoom, you can just share it, like as if you're sharing a screen. But you go on the bottom, and then you go into. Let me see. Ah, I can't screen share it because uh, Robert is sharing. Um, but don't worry about it. You have. You can select the windows, and then on the very top, there's different bars, like screen. Oh wow, that's beautiful. Or you just book Robert. <laughs> book <Yeah>. now. <laughs> okay, time's up. Robert does. Oh. Robert does have an open calendar. So you can stop booking his time. Exactly. Yeah. No, don't do that. I don't want to know. No. Share your calendar. Like, yes. We just and, need it for 15 minutes while we do a solution sketch. Can you just do nothing but acorns? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. So we'll set this aside. Nice. We do one for the voting thing. Okay. Thanks so it looks like we've got a lot of different options. And normally in a, in a session like this, we would do some affinity diagramming and switch it around. So I'm going to skip that just for now. So there may be some, some duplicates in here, but that's OK. Um, mm. What we're going to do is we're going to do a voting session. So all the yellow cards you see here, you're going to have the ability to put in some votes on which ones you think are your favorites. It can be ones that you put in there. Or if you look at some, what somebody else has done, you can choose that as well. But you only want to vote on the yellow cards. And just for fun, since we have so many votes, I'm, a, I'm actually going to give everybody 10 votes. And this thing is going to get ginormous. <laughs> I don't know yeah. how big. Make, make it, sure we can still see the stickies. <laughs> yes, I was going to say because it's going to be fat, it's going to be huge. So um, I'm going to do a voting session, and I think uh, people you are get already 10 creating votes. circles. Hold on, I think. Yeah, yeah. don't know. No creating circles. This is just no, just no, no circles, vote. please. <laughs> yeah, because what happens is is that if you if you start putting these graphics on here, and I got to eliminate them that you can vote on the graphics and then the, they won't count as votes. So don't put your dots in yet. So I'm going to take these out. Do not vote on the only vote on the yellow cards and you're good. OK, so hang tight, everybody. We're doing a vote. Ten votes and I'll show you how it works. So you're voting on the top ice breaking ideas, ice breaking ideas. And any member of the Smurl can do it. So. Basically, you click on a card to vote. You're going to hold down the shift key to remove a vote if you put it on there. And no one's going to see where your vote is on. Mm -hmm. Now, we have 87 people that are voting. Um, again, only vote on the yellow cards themselves. And I'm going to try and track and see where the which, which particular anonymous animal finishes their votes first. You can also vote on a particular one more than once to stack them if you want to, but it's totally up to you. So right now. and. I'll bring the music back in here. We've got, uh, let's see, we got a bunch of people. Oh, we got the sea lion that's got four votes. Maybe a different key for each one. Three votes, not two votes yet. Getting close. So, so far, the shark's leading the way with a lot of four votes behind them. By the way, this is something you do as a facilitator. You just, for fun, you just do a call. The sea lion's about there, two votes. Oh, and the sheep crosses the finish line first. So the sheep gets the grand prize and one of the biggest votes I've ever done with 87 or 86 people voting. We're just going to wait and see how the rest of the votes go in. Um, and I'll have a threshold at some point where if I don't see certain people voting where there's like, you know, there's 10 votes and nobody's voting or the voting seems to be still, then I'll leave it be. But for now, go ahead and put your votes where you'd like to. And we'll wait for everyone to get done with what they're doing. It's just a part. That is so many people. By the way, the first thing I learned on a guitar was Gene's Addiction and Smashing Pumpkins. Though I can't remember the, uh, the tunes for each, either one of those. But they're really nice. easy to play in a bass guitar. Now that's one. 
Can you guess that one? <laughs> I think that's before your time. That's okay. Uh, let's see. We're getting close to ending the votes. I mean, we're getting the, I mean, it seems like we're halfway done with most people. Um, we got a lot of people that's already finished. I'll give, let's say one more minute for voting and then, uh, get your votes out there. Uh, whoever's still voting will have to kind of wait for an actual session in the future that they can be part of on mural to do their votes. So until then we'll wait. I think I just voted for the gray background. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, that'll be interesting you, to see. You can remove the bolts. You just have to hold down the shift key and then click again. Oh, thanks, Sandy. Oh, yeah. You're you're the boss. <laughs> you're you can. Yeah. Now I can see that you, why you're like the most the highest user in Europe. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and for those who are done with voting if you want to see who has not yet voted there is on the top there is um, uh, a gray bar says 90 people are voting and then beside mm -hmm. it it has a uh, down arrow and when you just click on it you can see the process there mm -hmm. yeah so there's a number of uh, there's a number of animals that aren't voting that are probably just uh, kind of uh, staying dormant, which is fine. Typically, when it gets down to like the last votes, I'll look for the people that have ten votes and and consider that like the um, the uh, like the the ceiling. Like there's sometimes mural will uh, not count votes for some people, and you they may seem like they're not voting, but they've actually got all the votes in. It happens, especially with this many people. Um, so we're almost done. I'll give 30 more seconds. So put in your last votes, put them wherever you like, and uh, we'll stop the voting and see where things ended up. Pick I your just favorites. See someone with minus 14 votes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's, that, that's somebody who's like voted, that has so much influence over the board they, that they pretty much like, uh, <laughs> they voted for somebody else's votes, so. Okay, we're nearing stuff up. Panda's got five votes. There's two horses with five and four votes. It's like a virtual Noah's Ark if you're into that. It's like trying to get all the animals on the boat. Ten seconds. We're shutting it down. Five, four, three, two, one. Zero. If you don't have your votes in now, the votes are not going to be cast. Here we go. Let's see. What are your best ice breaking games for remote workshops? When I end the voting session, you'll be able to see on the screen the results of everyone's vote. Uh, and I'll be able to interpret it as, as the ad hoc facilitator of the session. So, mending <laughs> the session for everybody. Now it looks like <laughs> the got the most votes. <laughs> well, Sandy, there's Sandy, another, there's another Sandy, one direction. So, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> the answer so, yes, is design clarify, boards. When you do a voting session, the yellow cards <laughs> is what you're going to click on, but that's okay. <laughs> they probably didn't know because once you click on it, you can't see it from that point, vantage point. So it looks like uh, the favorite holiday place was something that Sandy had mentioned before that has a lot of unique voters, so that was close. We had a couple of people that put in multiple votes for two truth, one lie, vote on the lie. That would be interesting. <laughs> uh, and then which superhero are you? Yes, I've seen that actually come up with a couple of other people uh, that are facilitators that have used this uh, mm -hmm. almost all the time on the first day. And it helps to uh, figure out what people are proud about in terms of their values or what, how they see themselves. So yeah. And then we have other things like describe your lunch in, in emojis, which should be interesting. Lego model sharing and go mute, do a dance and let people guess what kind of music. Very, very creative. Wow. <laughs> I, I mean, we should stop the, the whole th the Q&A now and just do this for the entire time. We'll get better answers. So um, <laughs> typically when you get done with a, with a session like this uh, and you see all the votes as you're seeing it on my screen, you want to go after the ones that, that have the highest number and you border them. So I'll take like this one and I think 23 is over here. Uh, let's see. I think the next one is like 19 
Um, but essentially, you don't necessarily move them. You just border them for now, because you, then you can copy and paste them and put, put them somewhere else. So I'll just do a few. And then when I go down to the, the highlight votes in my screen, I turn that off. All the numbers, all the numbers go away, but I at least see uh, which ones are the ones that are most popular. And you can change colors with those as well. So thank you very much, everybody, for kind of participating in this. Um, we'll go back to our regular scheduled program. If you want to do this towards the end again at the very top of the second hour, uh, we can go ahead and do that and just expand out the, uh, the, um, the canvas. But we'll go back to some of your original questions and then you guys can kind of take this and I'll go ahead and highlight all three of those and just give them different colors so that they are a little more distinct against the background. So there you go. No, not that much. Let's do this. Let's make it green. There you go. And this one. Yes, describe your lunch emojis. Panelists, how are you feeling about the session so far? We're a little over an hour into it. How do you feel about it, how everything's going? I feel that I'm having fun and I've learned some exercises. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> some new icebreakers. Yeah, really, really new content we can repurpose. That's great. Yeah, I'm I'm really I'm really liking it. So far it's been it's been really, really good. Mm -hmm. Um but how about I'm, the participants? Maybe they can put down. Yeah, that's a good idea. So if you're in, in if you're the in the chat. chat right now, you're on YouTube. Go ahead and put in your chat if you think this is going well. Uh, you can use um, let's just use a scale of one to ten. Ten being like, oh my god, it's amazing. To one, it's like I'm about to hit the close button. So uh, go ahead and put that in. Let us know. And if you do have a particular rating, uh, if you think that it could be improved to a nine, put that or a ten put that as well in your response. So it's like, okay, it's a seven, but you should probably do more of X. Or if it's a, it's a four, I came here for this and you're giving me this and it's not working out. So do put that in the chat because we'll review that at this point and see if we, we should change direction or, or slightly change the what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. um, and let me go over to YouTube really fast. I think I have to pause my share just really fast. And go over here and let's get out of full screen just to check on the YouTubes to see what people are seeing over there. Um, Mardea goes an eight. Darwin goes a 9.9. .9, so you can need it to improve by a 0.1. Um, and let's see. Nope, so far, everything seems to be all right. Daniel's there, Sabu's there. Uh, most of the people that are from GVDS are kind of out in there as well. Um, oh, Rajesh, so people are asking for the mirror link. Let me go ahead and put that in real fast. So if people are coming in late, um, let me go ahead and populate the um, the Zoom chat with, well, Sandy's beat me to it again. That's one thing I know in the GVDS is that whenever we're in the same session together, she's usually like much faster on the draw than I am. And once again, she's proven me right. Okay. And uh, I'll also put it in the YouTubes so that people have it there. Do, 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 do. And there you go. Okay. So let's get back to the questions. <laughs> we, ha we have three arrows. <laughs> now it's like big giant arrows over here. It's like, all right, fine. This is gonna get this is gonna get more audacious, I think, as they go there. So um, the, there's there's two questions here. So I'll bring them both down, but we'll we'll do the first one. So I'm gonna take this one that has red and green dots as well as stars. We're gonna put them down here. This is for all panelists involved. Um, the first question is, what are the most challenging sessions when you do a remote sprint and why? So we'll tackle that one first. Who on the panel would like to take on that question? I can go first. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, I guess that it really, really depends on your experience, first of all, with facilitating um, a remote design sprint. And second of all, how familiar you are with the challenge and with the team you're working with. So typically a facilitator should just be an orchestrator, making sure that everything runs smoothly and not participate actively in exercises. However, let's say you are someone in your team and that you're working on a daily basis uh, with these people and you're very familiar with their processes, with their challenge uh, or with the desired outcome. In that case, uh, you can definitely both facilitate and also participate in the workshop as long as you have everything prepared and yeah. you have a template to use and you are very fam familiar with the tool. Um, probably, I just want to make sure that maybe the, the person who addressed this question, um, I, I hope I'm kind of tackling this the right way. In terms of the actual, the most challenging sessions, uh, I'm just considering that maybe it's the actual exercise and the design mm -hmm. sprint. 
I would say uh, the first two days are obviously the most uh, complex ones. Like we're using the four day design sprint. So just for clarity. So the first two workshop days, Monday and Tuesday, when you need the whole sprint team, uh, those are particularly hard to organize because the, there's a lot of people in that you have to manage and a lot of exercises back to back. But actual sessions, I would say uh, storyboarding by far the most complicated one in terms of keep keeping people engaged like it's end of the day they've already squeezed out their entire mental uh, capacity up until that point and you you tell them okay now we're gonna have to do a storyboarding and they're like oh my god but andre had some really great uh, insight on this kind of uh, making sure someone's kind of uh you kind of have two people facilitating this that's going to make your life so much easier and then kind of switching roles that has proven to be really useful mm -hmm. and um one exercise is the concept sketch that we have previously done online in person with everyone but then we switched it over as an offline exercise uh we we talk about this specifically in the youtube series videos but just to kind of keep everything in like a one liner, hopefully, um, is we give the uh, concept sketching as an offline exercise with clear instructions. So you do notes and ideas, then you do crazy eights, and then you do the concept uh, sketch on your own, and we give them a deadline uh, by when they need to fill this in, right? So um, uh, that, that's kind of like the, the hack that we found for a pretty hard exercise. But storyboarding is by far the hardest because you have to align multiple people and you have to work on it together. Whereas on the concept sketch, you have to do it individually. So I would say those are the two most complicated sessions and drawing the map. One thing I found that works really well with storyboarding, especially if the group is has low energy is to that. It seems like there's a part of a design sprint where every person or role has their moment. So uh, case in point with storyboarding, the designer, especially if they're a lead designer, can be the person that takes the lead in uh, kind of facilitating that session on storyboarding. They're more aware of the system design, the, um, the different design patterns that are used within a company or organization. Uh, they also know how to basically put things together. They tend to be stitchers and when it comes to the prototype. So if they kind of guide the storyboarding process and are taught how to do it, uh, that tends to alleviate a lot of the brain drain that happens within the group and everyone, you know, everyone usually uh, relies on that individual to kind of move things along from a leadership perspective. But again, it just depends on the personnel in the room and if that designer is actually has enough energy to kind of move forward with things. Yeah. Another point maybe to add from, <clears throat> from my perspective as someone who's ran like countless of sprints and probably experimented a lot with the structure in the beginning. Uh, at AJ and Smart, we had often very challenging sessions mm -hmm. when we tried to shift things around, <clears throat> change the structure, or shorten something down. And that's also something that I, I did some research on, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> on like either past clients or teams that had unsuccessful design sprints. And because in our perspective, it was like, this is the tool. It's always successful because it always has an ending. And they all had in common that they tried to tinker with the recipe. They all tried to change things up. They tried to some, remove a part or make it shorter, make it two days instead of three, or make it one day instead of two. And it just leads to confusion. These The parts, there's a reason for why these things are in there. And if you're not as fluent as someone who can kind of really understand what they're doing but you're just trying to save time um i recommend not doing that <laughs> and just sticking to the structure that's there and there's you know there's enough um enough red, like enough guidance out there by all of us so the best the best facilitators i've ever seen the best analogy i can make for this is like literally iron chef they have, they, they really know their craft. They're really good at what they do. They could take ingredients on the fly and make things work. But you, you're talking about an elite few uh, group of facilitators that can do audibles, that can basically break things apart and take things together. People that have been doing this for years. But there are individuals that can do audibles where if the team's moving really fast, they can reshuffle activities and organize things in a fashion so that there's much less time taken on some things but emphasizing on another. Whereas if you have a group that's really struggling, that person knows to 
change the, the, the all and alter the schedule so that you're still getting things done and still moving in the proper direction, but maybe you're adding some things that normally aren't part of the sprint, but get people to where they need to go in terms of outcomes. But mm-hmm. they're, they're, you, you really, it really comes down to experience and knowing the people that are in the room, personnel in the room and what yep. will work and what won't. But to your point, yeah, you don't necessarily want to chop things down just to save time without understanding the consequences of doing so, knowing that some of the exercises later on in the process are really dependent on how the quality of the work that you do in the first couple of days. Mm-hmm. And that's that, period. <laughs> Thank you. No, that was, that was very uh, thank you. Is very apropos. Okay. Um, any tips on facilitating and at the same time participating? In, okay, we just answered this, I think. Yeah. Would they want the same? Okay. I'm sorry. I, I didn't read the second one in there, but um, maybe it could be this. Boop. Put that there. And somebody's selecting that, so I'm not even going to go into that. So uh, in my view, I can't see what's happening up above. So I'm gonna go, when I go back to the questions, I'm actually wondering what's going to happen. <laughs> So, uh, okay, so I think we're set with those two. Does anybody, do, do you wanna make any other comments on these on these two questions? Raz, Anna, or Sandy, any, anyone else? Nope. Okay. I'll just add another reply there to make sure it's. Yeah, probably looks good. Okay. Right, so we go back up to the Q&A up here. Um, so we got one, <laughs> Orange hexagon. Okay, um, I'm. I, I got my eye on that one, but I'm gonna go to this one that looks like it's got so many dots that it's drowning in them. Uh, how do you handle storyboarding in a in a sprint with a remote team? So, I'm gonna grab this one, copy it, and bring it down here. Zoop, zinga, and I'll bring everybody over. Oop, did it not copy? Okay, there we go. So the question is, um, who was this for? Was this under a name? It was under a name, wasn't it? Raz. Uh, yep. Raz again. I'm going to have to start picking out ones that don't have a bunch of dots. I almost sometimes think that Raz is just going, you know what? I'm just going to, when no one's looking, I'm going to put dots there just to get like all the stuff. But <laughs> I know that's not the case. Um, so Raz, how do you handle storyboarding in a sprint with a remote team? Uh, I think we, we touched this subject twice uh, back in the previous question and right at the beginning when Andre mentioned this, uh, kind of having someone to help you with facilitation on that, that front, but specifically for storyboarding, uh, things that we've done that work. Um, for storyboarding, is same, same way you would do in an in-person sprint. Uh, the nice thing about the fact, it kind of connects with how we do concept sketching. So concept sketching is done offline by all of our participants and they have to take pictures of the concepts and upload them to the board or send them over to us so we can upload them to the board. The reason why we do that is because even when we do in-person sprints, in storyboarding, we try to repurpose components from those concepts. Like we yeah. actually physically cut out parts of uh, concepts that work really well. And we also do the same thing by uh, propping their images and parts of the images in their concepts. So that's that's something really useful that we found. And it's kind of gives people a feeling that as, as those of you who know what's going on in the sprint is people come up with a lot of ideas, but you only select probably one or, or maybe Maximum. two that you combine. And at sometimes people might feel that their ideas are left behind so what we tell them, kind of encourage them that, hey, you're doing this concept. And uh, if it doesn't get voted, uh, you're basically going to scrap it forever and not going to use it. We kind of tell them, look, there's a chance that in the storyboarding phase, we might repurpose some elements. Mm-hmm. So that way people kind of feel that, oh, my concept didn't get fully voted, but at least bits of it are being taken inside the storyboard. Mm-hmm. Um, another great uh, tip that we found is give people tasks. So if you look at the storyboard at the eight panels, you might say, okay, uh, Robert, Sandy, and Raz, we're going to work on the first three. Uh, Sandy and uh, Anna, you're going to work on the next uh, few. Anonymous Turtle and Anonymous Shark, you're going to work on the next two. So kind of uh, put people into micro teams and just tell them, okay, go ahead and, and start working on that uh, together. Kind of start um, putting your ideas into place. And what we found useful is we actually leave the call and, and each of us joins their own individual call. So we don't talk on top of each other. And when we'll do, we're doing kind of like these 
uh, segmented bits and then we come together again, it's uh, so much easier to kind of uh, discuss on what's um, on what what ha what have been done uh, individually. I mean, at the, the smaller group level. So these are just some some storyboarding tips and tricks that we found work. Uh, don't let people just sit around, right? Just just uh, just commenting on stuff. Have them do things. I think that's that's the best uh, the best set of, of of advice that comes to mind right now. Anything else okay. you like to add? Any of Anna, Sandy, Robert? I'm sure you have some. I I, I agree. I I have like two two thoughts that um, I can share on this. The one thing is, um, people will take exactly that time that you set it to. So if you set it to four hours, it'll take four hours. If you set it to three hours, it'll take four, three hours. The difference is the quality of the output. So the more time you eventually block in for this, the more detail you will have. You can spend two days on this and it's going to be super detailed, but you know, you don't want to spend two days on the storyboard. Yeah. Um, the other thing is, and that's just kind of how I structure it, um, is saying we do three kind of sessions. So three 50 minute sessions. First, you go through just laying out the, well, actually that's not part of the session. Before you actually start, you make sure that you have the user story kind of mapped out on every individual frame so that it's clear this frame is going to have probably about this content. This frame is going to have this content and like a post-it note that says it. And <clears throat> so that's in the beginning. Then you do a really rough outline. What needs to be there? What's a button? Maybe what's the kind of screen? And maybe put draw in the concepts as Raz just said, basically like some cutouts from the concepts that you drew before or from the lightning demos and just draw them in that direction just so it's kind of slightly there. Mm -hmm. Then the second round is making it, filling in some, some details, making it cohesive so it actually makes more sense so that everybody agrees on the basic outline. And then the third pass is really just polishing it and filling out the details. And this is also, again, uh, same as Raz just said, and you can engage everyone because everybody has content to contribute with and everybody's super happy to, you know, produce some text or get us some images from somewhere. Mm -hmm. And it's it's simple tasks, but they see how they contribute to it and making this beautiful in the end. Yeah. Okay. One thing that we also do is sometimes we would create like a Kanban board, so assign tasks to every person and then yes. just move things around. Yeah. We have also done um, live storyboarding section, uh, which we tend to like a little bit more drafty style, but we use the tools in Miro. So we create, we just create boxes and sticky. So it's more like a collaborative um, section that way. That's cool. You can also like search for buttons on the icons or something. Yeah. You can make really rough, rough kind of uh, composites with Mural. Oh, that and um, also, sorry, before I forget, take breaks in between because the storyboard is super intense. It seems, uh, I mean, it's probably kind of obvious for, for us, um, but it's, yeah, always like half an hour break somewhere in between. Just do, do nothing. Yeah. <laughs> Are you saying stare at the, stare at the, 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 the wall? No, no, I'm kidding. The sky. <laughs> Then, then if anyone does that, then the entire thing's in trouble. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to look at um, Andre. Uh, there, there's one that and an elephant is just basically making a nice little collage of circles around. So I'm going to take that one and I'm going to bring that down here. So if that anonymous elephant wants to continue the circles around the, uh, the question as to kind of put some focus on, you're more than welcome to. Um, if, there we go. Beep, bada, beep, burp, beer. Okay, so uh, Andre, what's the difference between a design sprint as described in Sprint, AJ, and Smart, and a UXer working one sprint ahead compared to the development team? Ooh, that's a nice question. Ooh, that's I a say. stickler. <laughs> <laughs> what have you done, Andre? <laughs> um, yeah, so we um, started off with just a design sprint based on the book. And um, 
we did it exactly page by page, exactly as the book said for a couple of weeks, every single week. And then we realized there's some bits where people still talk too much. Things like the map, or I think the, there was some, some different, I think they were doing the expert interview at the later point in, yeah. in the day. Yeah. And we were like, that's ridiculous. That doesn't make any sense. And we're just like, either shifted it forward. Yeah, right. So we actually threw that out and replaced that with this like beginning section, which is more of an introduction, talking about a problem, because in our experience, people just want to sit at the table get, and just get started and just get started talking. And that's why we kind of, we, we basically just removed a lot of gaps and try to, there was this, um, the pre-story, I think we added in before the storyboard session, we added on the, um, the map exercise, like the story, the user story map exercise, so that you don't go from just a bunch of concepts and try to jam them together to kind of a step in between in first uh, aligning on the actual user story for the storyboard. And that saved tons of time that literally that that made so we used to take an entire day for the storyboard and that shortened it down for like to like four hours mm -hmm. uh i know it sounds still sounds like a lot of time but it it, it, it literally like half the time we spent on the storyboard mm -hmm. um so and that's essentially the the difference the book is five days we did it in four um this i guess we all do like other variations of it now because all these like modules are separatable and you can shift them around any way you want can you we got some. I think our audience is starting to get pushy <laughs> between <laughs> raising raising hands and kind of putting on there. It's like these are follow up uh, questions. I think Raz, you guys have have like an agenda in your write up, no? Um, yeah. yeah, just look at look at that. I think that's pretty correct. I can also share uh, some. I don't know if where on my. Yeah, I can just post something on LinkedIn for like a, what it currently looks like because it evolves and we all like evolve these things individually. Um, and, uh, yeah, but I think that the primary resource is the article just Matt wrote up because that shows it really well. I think, uh, I do have an answer to this particular question. Um, so I was actually in that, that mode that the question describes where you have somebody that's doing user experience design, that's working one sprint ahead of a development team that's doing agile mm -hmm. versus what's described in the design sprint book or what AJ and smart was. <laughs> And the difference being is that the AJ and Smart model was working above the the kind of the product the the um, like the production line or the project life cycle, whereas you, yeah. if you're in the project life cycle, a UXer tends to be only concentrating on production related um, artifacts and kind of getting those ahead, the, together for development, whether they're screens and user stories or screens and epics or whatever the 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 the, the um, kind of the like the rhythm is for that for getting stuff done whereas the book describes kind of in the strategy realm in the overall spectrum of what the problem is and where how you're supposed to kind of orient the team to work on their work or to, to put their focus so the main differences is just the the level of exposure of the work that you're doing on the aj and smart side of things versus in in, in comparison to the build versus what typically happens in an enterprise with ux is that they're in the production like cycle and they're primarily working on artifacts and the design sprint activities that are corresponding to that tend to be just a subset of what you could do with the overall spectrum of things. So that's, mm -hmm. that would be my answer to that. It just really depends on where you Definitely. are. Definitely. You, you just get, you just basically get the development team to collaborate in it. So like, as you said, it's like a top meta sprint thing where you have everybody who's responsible work together on one thing and then and then you get, yeah, like the, the comments, UX is part of the delivery. It's like this department and then there's the development department and marketing department, whatever. They all feed from the content that's been produced from the uh, official design sprint, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. official, unofficial, whatever it is now. Um, let me look at the chat really fast because there's been stuff here. I think people are putting comments, correct? Yeah. So the people are, so one thing that you can do, and I probably should have mentioned this in the beginning is, is as we're kind of saying our answers, if you want to put in your own kind of follow-up or your comments around this, the, the chat is a perfect place to kind of do that. Um, 
so that if we do kind of fall back and look at this with the time remaining, we can do so. Um, would you say design sprint is a what, why, and the dev process is about how? That's so contextual to the organization. It, generally speaking, that could be true. Um, but I've seen, just like there's labels for different types of designers, I've seen design sprints work with different in different capacities depending on who's deploying them. So people could use design sprints just for doing production work versus people that are searching for problem framing in design sprints. So they're using that to kind of flesh out what exactly people are going to be working on. So it, it could be both. Um, the, the link to the recording will be done, will be sent to everyone who registered. And I'll also, uh, as a follow up to this session, I'll be putting this on LinkedIn and other places where the YouTube link will, will also be uh, featured as well. Um, by the way, there's been a Jerome for mouse sighting. I just saw his cursor flash through, so I know he's here too. Um, okay, so let's go back up and uh, real quick on the panelist side, we are 90 minutes into our session. How is everyone feeling in terms of energy levels? Are you all good? Beautiful. Good. All good. Yes. Okay. All good. All right. Let's see here. Um, I think one's going to go there. So, Anna, let's get to get one for you. There's one that has a double that has a double circle on it. <laughs> circle. <It's> a Venn diagram. <laughs> yeah, Venn diagram. Like now we're starting to get the most creative questions actually get answered. It's no longer about like who's saying what. It's now it's now it's all about what people are doing. So. If I can read past the Venn diagram and the dots, it says, what are the best selling strategies to get your clients across your workshops? Mm -hmm. Excellent question. Huh. Ooh. I guess that probably one or two months ago, but I guess that one month ago, my answer would um, be a bit different. <laughs> right now, we get a lot of requests and we don't have to do that, that much selling, I guess, yeah. due to the current situation. Um, the fact that we do all the work that we do, all our services are delivered in a workshop format. This was a strategic decisions, uh, decision for us as a company. Uh, we just found it to be more effective and efficient to work this way, even to price it and package it. Uh, I guess that for the design sprint, it was quite easy to begin back on the process and uh, the value that you get because it is an amazing, fantastic process to get there, you know, use it with your team. Um, other workshops like strategy or North Star metric, these are still new and people are curious to experience them. Um, one strategy that we found it really useful, we always showcase examples of previous workshops or previous um, outcomes. We don't focus that much necessarily on the process, but rather than uh, we focus more on the outcome, what's the, what they get in a short amount of time. And we try to compare that with what it would typically take them to get to the same result. This is another strategy. Um, we have a lot of examples. This is pretty interesting. Um, we also use something interesting. It's called sprintfit.io. This is something that we've worked on a couple of months ago together with um, Benoit, knowledge, yeah. Benoit and Knowledge Expert. Yes. So they're in a company from Switzerland. And together with them, we've put together this knowledge sprint survey, which basically tells you how ready your uh, initiative is for a sprint. Yeah. I, I totally uh, recommend to check it out. Yeah. We, we basically, whenever people approaches us and, and says that, hey, we have this, this challenge at hand, what we do is we just pop it into this uh, sprint mm -hmm. fit thing. Uh, it's super cool, kind of evaluates the challenge from multiple perspectives and also kind of gives you a mm -hmm. score of how well the sprint would, would work in that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, for those who are interested, uh, make sure to, mm -hmm. to look into it. Um, and just one more thing here, uh, there are a lot of um, clients that approach us with different challenges and not every challenge is, um, let's say, okay for a workshop. Or challenges that they do not necessarily require a workshop; they require execution. Then, in that case, we do not try. We do not try to push our services. Um, also, we try to find like uh, repl replicable models for any upcoming remote sessions that they may have, whether it's a meeting or a workshop. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think that's Anything pretty else? much what, what we tend to do is when people reach out to us, and then we kind of say, "Okay, this is how we do things in the workshop format." Uh, when when they when we feel they kind of are not bought into it, we uh, we ask them like, how would you do it if we were not in the picture? How would you do it? Well, we'd probably just stumble upon it for like a few weeks, then probably decide on doing it, and then we kind of have them uh, like say their problems out loud. 
right? Because um, they, they know why they reached out to us. And in order to kind of flip that conversation, we asked them, why did you reach out to us in the first place? What part of our communication or the stuff that we've done online or recommendations that you've got for us, what made you say, I want to have a conversation? And we kind of tap into that inherent uh, trigger that made them reach out in the first place. We kind of piggyback on that. And we say like, well, we've been dragging this challenge for four months. Mm -hmm. And then, well, we're going to help you go past it in just a few weeks, if that's why you reached out in the first place. Yeah. Another strategy that we have, we always run a sailboat exercise with the team and they immediately get bought yeah. in after they see the outcome after one hour and a half of workshop. Yeah. That, that's, we kind of give them a preview with the LDJ. We kind of do it for free and say, hey, let's look at the challenge. Let's uh, do this quick exercise together. And that kind of uncovers all of their challenges to us. And then that, that's also a great opportunity for upselling because inside of the LDJ, they might kind of select the biggest challenge, but you also mm -hmm. have the other ones. So it's, it's we kind of uh, take some of the work from the mm -hmm. sprint and we kind of do it in the LDJ as some, some sort of mm -hmm. prep prep work. I guess there are a lot of selling strategies that you could you could approach, but your job is to find out what's the biggest fear or what's the biggest challenge that your client has right now and try to tap into that. Yeah. So for example, if the organization never worked with Mural or Miro, it's your job to ensure them that you're gonna train their employees into you know using the tool and make yeah. them feel comfortable with this type of, of environment. Yeah. You know, uh, Anna and Roz, if you're think if you're looking for content for your next video series, I think you may have tapped into something that I think a lot of people will probably uh, engage with in terms of this. This is something that I see people doing wrong all the time when it comes to selling design sprints as like a service that corresponds to their main business. Yeah. And I think it's really important to do exactly mm -hmm. what you're talking about, which is focus on the pain, figure out why they're asking for your services and other, all the other things they've been saying in here. So I just want to say that while I'm in the moment to say, like, if you're thinking about another series, this would definitely like get some attention or, or I think there are people that are looking for that. Um, so real quick, uh, so just some maintenance. Uh, somebody asked that oh, about the link to the previous session we had, part one, and we'll put that in there. In fact, in the mural itself, thanks to Sandy Lamb, I do believe we have up here a resources section in the mural itself. And up here is a link to the previous one we did, I think. Um, yep, right there. Best practices with session one was this one. So I'll kind of gather everyone here just so people know. Um, well, somebody already did that. And this, th these are all particular resources that were curated before we got into our session today. Check those out, see if they're useful for you. Um, some of them, including like the, the mural guide here for remote workshops, it's excellent. It's one of those foundational books that you should definitely check out. Um, yeah, so I think this is, this is curated by the panelists and it's something you can probably uh, consider. Um, okay. Let's go back and hear Sandy. I'm going to go into the orange hexagon one that's over here um, because it seems to be the one that's also got some like detritus there. It's moving uh. off of that. Uh, so we'll go a little bit further. It says, is mural any better? I can't even read it anymore. <laughs> <I know. laughs> well, it's gotten, it's gotten a little bit popular. So I'm going to make that a different, I can't even make a different color because my, um, I think murals kind of get a little bit, uh, get a weighty because I'm starting to see that the, uh, the, um, what do you call it? The, 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 the okay. sub bar is not popping up whenever I'm putting in here. So I'll zoom back out here. Well, a quick tip. If you are sometimes in the middle of the workshop, your mural is not working. A quick fix could just be refreshing the page. That's true. And all right, there we go. So Sandy, is Mural any better than Miro? <laughs> no, no this pressure. Is like one of the, that is like one of the questions that I've been getting the most recently, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and understand that there, there are representatives from both companies watching this and will watch in the future. And mm -hmm. so <laughs> I'm putting as undue pressure to you that both of them are gonna be judging you after this with, <laughs> uh, <laughs> with extreme prejudice, so. Can what someone just pull the question? article that you, you wrote? <laughs> I think that summarizes <laughs> it really well. 
Um, well, actually, like to answer this question, like my answer is always like just find the one that you feel most comfortable with. I don't know if one is better than the other because they always like one is in some features they are better on, than the other. So that's I can't really compare it that way. But the tools are actually very, very, very similar. Like doesn't matter like I use Miro a lot but when I jump to the other tool then I can easily just use it so it's really it's just your preference it really comes down to the personal preference that way um, yeah I think it's almost like this is the least thing you should worry about if you want to start a remote workshop just pick one and then just start using it and you will be okay Okay. And if you want to just try it, sign up for the um, uh, trials and then just feel up which one you like better. Yeah, it's like running shoes, really. You just you just have to basically try it out. Try yeah. them both out. They but both they have do, free trials. Have, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, there's the article I wrote about it. And that that basically took a lot of the feedback I got from people when I asked the open ended questions about what they are. Uh, yeah, what they what they thought they what 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 kind of how they both size up. Neither of them are bad or good in either way, but they all have their advantages and disadvantages. And both companies are actively working on their products to make them better, which is good for everybody. So um, there was a real quick question about Sprint IO grading process. That is, if you go to the site, that's actually explained and how they get to their their um, how they get to their formula, or at least it should, if I remember. I, the, I have. I have the article when it explains it so much more better. I'm going to add it now. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. So let's go back up and let's get to a question. Let's see here. <laughs> All right. This is hilarious. Now we have yellow <laughs> arrows and, and, and <laughs> with faces on them. Oh my goodness. All right. Oh. Okay. Commit we got. <laughs> You know, I, I feel like expanding this session out just to see what, what we can get in here. The people actually put in red, like this is their particular question. So, okay. So the one with the green and, and black hearts, as well as the, the, the cat and the yellow and the circles is, uh, is one here. It says, after clustering, do you read through all sticky notes or ask participants to share what they wrote? So as I'm transferring this down to the bottom here, Anyone on the call can kind of tackle this question. And on the exercise, I think uh, mostly like after clustering, do you read through? Like not all of them. I think we leave out always the ones with the one dots while saying they're still going to be there. Don't worry about them. And then we never look at them again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's like, uh, well, yeah, I guess sometimes we reuse them. Uh, but uh, yeah. It, it makes sense to read them out after you've um, after you've brainstormed, especially the ones with the highest votes, because then people keep that in, in their short term memory and think about it consciously. Um, for me, the answer is no. I don't because I'm but that's the nature of the beast with me as a facilitator. I'm very execution driven. I'm like, go, 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 move forward, do that. And for people that like discussion, it is exasperating. People get like visibly, you can't even tell in their face sometimes in the video how frustrated they are, but it's like literally it's palpable because they're like intently staring like we aren't discussing anything. I can't, there's no context. And I totally get that. Um, but I tend to, after I cluster, I ask people to review. I ask them to look at each cards and point out particular things that are duplicates. And then I go into voting after we kind of like pare it down a bit. But then after a certain amount of exercises, I tend to go, okay, let's discuss what's happened so far. Mm -hmm. And that's where it's like, people have been like this waiting to talk, go, <laughs> and I have to put a time box on it and make sure that it doesn't consume the entire session. But it's to make sure that we're moving forward in the session and keeping to the time allotted that everyone has agreed to. So that's partly why I kind of do the way things the way I do. Yeah, I, I think I do also very similar to what you do, um, because to me, one of the reasons that we do clustering is just to trick people to read the stickies. So that's not like we kind of after the clustering, we kind of assume that they should have read everything. Yeah. Oh, I think I mis misunderstood the question. 
yeah for <clears throat> i i thought it's for after voting um but after clustering yeah like if you vote people will read through everything that they have to vote on sorry i'm just writing a note <laughs> right. yeah i tend to be a little uh a little like purposeful about that yeah. okay Never we let have... people drift out in discussion. Hey, Robert, yeah. do you want to do a one minute quick energizer with the participants? Seems like there was a suggestion back there. Yeah, do you want to do, do, do we want to kind of like take it, what we just did and kind of uh, take one of these, like the top photo one, and see about this? <laughs> Which like, one is that are you? An... Um, let's do this. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to, and, and panelists, you tell me if you want to do something different. I would, and Sandy, I don't have rights to the, the board. I would like to expand out the, either to the left or the right, the, the canvas. Um, oh, I thought you do. Okay. The image is, is kind of all in the background, but I don't have, it's locked. Oh, I see, okay. It was just <laughs> you saw my trick. Got it. <laughs> I see what you did there. Okay. <laughs> so you could extend it. Yep. But probably okay. down. Yeah, you can keep that one where it was. I've already got it. Okay, then we'll lock this sucker down. Oop, nope, come on, lock, come on. Oh, that's that's the thing that there's, so here's another glitch within uh, Mural for anyone who watches this in the future. If you have too many people moving in the, um, in the Mural, then the sub categories or the sub menus that pop up disappear almost immediately because it's it's trying to track too much and it's there's no way I can actually hit the hit the lock in time so we'll just work with we'll just work with what we have so this is going to be um, a one minute kind of like icebreaker so we've been focusing almost two hours on this board let's let's kind of go with what I had talked about before your favorite holiday place now what you're going to be doing with this one and I'm going to summon everybody over this is kind of a, an easy way of doing it um, Hang on a minute, I'll summon everyone here. So in Mural, as Sandy was saying before, you have the ability to find and search for images that correspond to something you want to put on to the board. The way to do that is, is if you look on the left-hand side in Mural, it's about six uh, icons down. If you put your mouse over, it says images. You basically select on that and start searching for an image that corresponds to something that you want to do. So a favorite holiday place for me would say Hawaii, That's something I'd like to go in. You find a picture that really works for you, you click and you drag it over into your favorite holiday place, and that will produce an image collage of what everyone on the call sees as like some favorite vacation spots they're gonna do in October or November. Hello again. What's your favorite vacation spot? Disneyland. All right, we're gonna do Disneyland. Mm -hmm. So Disney World. <laughs> Disney World, okay. So Disney World. So go ahead and do that. Uh, go ahead and use the image search for the mural and cut, basically drag something into that space as like your favorite, uh, your favorite vacation, and then we can kind of get a, an idea of where people want to go. Um, a tip for that: uh, if you want to search for a gift, you just have to put down gift and then search whatever. So say like gift and then Disneyland, and you probably find something around that. Oh, so it can be Disney World GIF, and then it'll have animations. Oh yeah, so we can do fireworks. How about this? Do I really want to put the rendering engine for for mural? And there we go. How about that one? <laughs> wow. It's like the beginning of a movie that's made from Disney. I think you're right. I'm gonna expand this out a bit. See if it'll give me the chance to do it. <laughs> and then we have a couple that basically. Uh, there you go. That works. <laughs> They have like cucumber in their eyes. Yeah, although, although, and then we have somebody who's planning a trip to hell to like beat demons. <laughs> so there's that. <laughs> we have, we have just being with family. What's up, bud? Um, I'm almost done. Almost done. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I can check for you after I get done with the call. Okay. Yeah, but have you done con yet? She said. Not, she didn't say con, she said the thing. Okay, she'll have to help me find it because I'm still not done. Okay? She's still doing it. Okay, then you have to wait. <laughs> okay? You have to go. No, I want to see. Okay, you want to see what else other images people are putting on here? Those are some nice ones. Look at all the, look at all the different vacation spots people can go on. 
That is a lot. Like <laughs> the one with the piggy. <laughs> I'm coming home. Yeah, there you oh. go. Right. Okay. So that's an example of a, of an ice breaking news. In fact, somebody's so enthusiastic about putting cucumber on their faces and, and drinking wine that they put it in there three times, or they've inspired other people to do it. Okay. So panelists, we have a choice. We have five minutes. Um, we can do one of two things, and maybe this is something that our audience can help us with. So how many of the panelists right now have a hard stop at one at, at the, at the top of the hour? How many of you have to go? Absolutely have to go. You've got to go eat. You're tired of answering questions. Your brain's dead. Like how many of us are, are basically done at the top of the hour? We can stay longer I'm... for like 15 minutes more. Oh, sorry, okay. Sandy. <clears throat> oh, I said I'm, I'm fine, but I'm not sure about the participants. <laughs> it's a long time. I agree on that. So. Yeah. yeah. Well, you can't sit there, bud. You can't sit there. Robert, how about we do a lightning round for questions? Just don't delay. Just just pick the questions that still have votes and just do like rapid fire, like yeah. super One quick replies. Under 20 seconds. Yeah, just a suggestion. <laughs> okay. Hey, Alden, you have to stop. No, you have to stop, bud. And you can take that in the other one. I'm going to have to count to five, bud. You have to leave. <laughs> Someone... Um... Someone on Twitter, I shared that with Sandy, was starting to call their kids co-workers because now they, <laughs> they have to work from yeah. home and they describe all the things that the kids I do. I would My say they're in, they're in training. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let's do a lightning round. I think it's a good idea. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start on the far right and work down. Um, so Sandy, you'll be first up. Basically take about anywhere from 10 to 15 seconds to answer the questions from top to bottom. And I know some of these aren't basically something that you can answer in that short period of time, but let's see how fast we can go with this. Where are we so, looking at? So I'm going to, I should be here. Let me grab over to this. So I'm up here at the questions section, right underneath your name. And the first one it's, it says is, how do you prepare for your online sessions? How do I prepare for my online session? I like to do a lot of things on Miro as you can already see. So I tend to do a lot of uh, instructions also on the mural directly on the mural itself. And I, it kind of serves as uh, one point where people can share things along. So that's, okay. yeah. Are you setting okay. a timer? I'm, I'm basically just gonna basically ask you the one after another. Uh, okay. Do you offer remote team sessions alone and recommend that where you're the only one responsible for team interaction, tech, content, et cetera? I do. Um, depends on your how comfortable you are doing it. Um, but definitely, if you have someone available, um, a co-facilitator will help you times. So how do you cost out developing, facilitating, and reporting on a session? Okay, where are you looking at? The green one. How do you what? How do you cost out developing, facilitating, and reporting on a session? How do, do I cross where, out? Yeah, I think I think the question is assuming that you're you're an independent, and I think that uh, <laughs> I think your people don't understand you work for Software AG, uh, so you're not you're not an independent. Uh, so um, yes, so no, I. <laughs> okay, so we'll skip that one. How do you motivate shy people to write sticky notes and contribute? Shy people to write sticky notes. <laughs> Normally, they are not shy on writing sticky notes. That's the whole point. So a lot of people are maybe shy on talking, but normally they can be pretty wild when writing sticky notes, especially when we involve them as an anonymous link. So they, they just join us uh, anonymously, so they, nobody can even tell who wrote that sticky. OK. Are there any firewall or security restrictions when working with corporates, Miro or Miro? Uh, yeah. What I know is that um, um, the paying company has a little bit better security, but I can be wrong on that. Does anyone have any other insight on uh, that? Did, who wants it? Who wants to go? I can just say from experience that uh, that people who work in security at companies tend to look at the digital certificates they use to exchange information. And if those aren't up to date, they will immediately shut down access. So they're pretty, they're pretty draconian when it comes to making sure that access is there. Yeah. A lot of companies also just restrict, yeah, just by, by default, they restrict service, uh, cloud services. Yeah. 
because they don't want to leak. Um, there are, um, so yeah, I got approached by a couple of uh, people, companies who had that problem and they were like, how do we do these remote things? And I think the, the, the first step is actually, you, like if you want to do this, you just have to self-host it. So kind of, if you don't, if you can't use cloud software for privacy problems, you should look into hosting it yourself. And there's a lot of tools that are online, like own cloud, or there's a lot of kind of open source ones that let you host the whiteboard solution yourself. Um, I, I can also go into that in detail another time or uh, in another webinar. Um, but yeah, that's, that was my comment. Sorry. <laughs> well, thank you, sir. Any experiences or thoughts on alternatives for interactive games, Sandy? We just, I thought we answered that, right? I think All we this, did too. Uh, I think you're right. Yeah. Uh, I, we even I demonstrated it. <laughs> How can a facilitator accommodate agile user stories to design sprints? I'm working on a CRM project with a business analyst and PM already came up with their epic story, sprint user stories. I'm going to tackle this because this is somebody who cheated and put their sticky right at the end of this. Um, that is something that if you want a lightning, a lightning thing for that, that's something that you have to kind of have a discussion with the business analyst and PM, because this is something that it really comes down to a conversation around expectations and outcomes. Um, if you want, if they're asking to accommodate particular end cases to user stories for a design sprint, you guys have to look at the flow of how the work is going to happen from one state to the next. It really is a high level conversation around expectations. Uh, there's no other way to slice that. Instead of going deep diving like I've done before, I'm going to go uh, horizontally on the ones that we haven't done so that we cover everything. But we'll start with the individuals. Andre, what are some good resources for developers that suddenly find themselves working remote? Uh, I think we answered that question. Also look to the right. OK. Um, Anna, what are your clients asking for the most when it comes to learning remote facilitation? Oh, yeah, a lot. So basically, there are four main categories. One are more general about how to replicate any meeting or workshop in a remote environment and how to communicate remotely with the team, how to centralize results and how to communicate them clearly. Then when it comes to tools, obviously, how to choose the right tools for your remote sessions, how to train people using them. Um, also, how to deal with the learning curve, because obviously, they will need some time to get uh, accommodated with those. Then is general facilitation overall what we've just uh, had a conversation around these topics uh, today and mainly preparation, how to prepare for remote sessions. So these yeah. are the four main topics. Okay. Uh, right. For me, do you think that in-person facilitation will be still be in demand after COVID-19 passes? Yes, but not as much. I think that once we go through this phase of a pandemic where everyone is remote and understands how to use this environment and how to use the tools, People who have used their have relied on their bread and butter to do in-person facilitation will still have that business, but it mm -hmm. will be smaller because businesses will realize that doing remote is actually cheaper and it's actually quicker in some aspects for some situations. So I really don't think that in-person facilitation is going to be as 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 much in demand. The good news is is that people that use that as part of their their daily living are already experimenting with the tools and figuring out how to use this environment. So you're going to see a lot of innovation by people who work in this space to accommodate both virtual and in person. So really, it's going to be a win win for everybody. Uh, Andre, how do you manage the reporting after the workshop has been done? Uh, I actually uh, read that message before. I'll just quickly. I oh, know I can't screen share. Damn it. OK. Um, or, or can you unlock me to screen share at the same time? Then I can show an example report. Um, I can stop sharing, and then you can share. You want to do that? OK, let's try that quickly. All right, okay, you're up. There. <clears throat> um, so that's that's one of the older sprints, but I think it just, I mean, it looks a little bit different now. I can show you like a client project for NDA reasons, but um, this was one uh, that's that I can show. And basically, the important part is to kind of tell everything that happened so that what whoever this document reaches can look at and understands exactly the concept. And the storyboard, there's the, the um, prototype and then uh, like all the summary and uh, like recommendations along. This is a relatively short one, so we do more extensive ones now, but that's essentially kind of the, um, the content of it. And um, yeah, also just 
you can you can look at uh, things. You can basically put together a PDF that imagine the person who gets it passes on to their decision maker, and the decision maker with zero context needs to understand what was that whole thing about, what happened, and what's the result, and how to use that. Cool. Um, for me, how do you make sure everyone is actively engaged in the session without playing the teacher and making people feel power distance because they then feel intimidated? I think we covered this one um, in a different question, so I'm going to skip mine. Andre, how do you facilitate the? How do you in, how do you integrate the facilitation into the design process? Uh, it sounds like either a very complicated question that I don't think we have time for now, or yeah. uh, I don't know how to interpret that. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it, that's something that probably is on a light let's, around question, but let, let's keep that for next time. For another time. Uh -oh. <laughs> my, my microphone is, is actually a, falling off. Okay, wait a minute. There you go. Uh, product managers have asked me to send them a temp template of a discovery workshop I did. How do I make sure they make full use of it? You can't ensure they make full use of it. They are going to piecemeal what they need and they're going to send it, use it for their reports and for who they're going to communicate with. Um, to save you time and energy, figure out what exactly the upstream is going to be for product managers and their reporting if they're open to that. And that way you can save, both of you can save a ton of time trying to guess what you're actually supposed to be giving them versus what you're gonna do as sort of a complete report. Because if history is any indication, most reports and, and things of that nature, the majority of them are not read beyond a cursory examination of what people need to know. So again, have a, have a conversation with your product manager to figure out what they want from it, like the template that you're gonna be using and fashion it for their needs. And then that way you'll probably save a ton of time. Uh, how do you manage participants' actions, such as how might we sketching and voting, et cetera, for Andre? Um, do we cover this, or do you want to make a comment on it? I think we covered most of that. How do you manage participants' actions? Just tell them. Yes. <laughs> so I do. Tell them why and tell them what, and then they do it. And, OK, what are the main concerns clients have when considering a design sprint uh, alignment? They are afraid that they're not going to align on one particular challenge. Uh, another concern that they get is because they do not fully understand the process and they want the whole thing designed at the end. <laughs> so much is <laughs> fixed. <laughs> another challenge that we face uh, is <laughs> they cannot decide on a decider <laughs> or they cannot bring the actual designer in the sprint. Yeah. Yeah. I think the two hours is probably good because everyone's starting to get that to that point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> How do you keep the attention of the attendees? It's easier to do other things, get distracted while you're remote. Um, you have to, you, as a facilitator, you just have, we, I think we've said it multiple times in different ways, uh, give people things to do, set expectations, have tasks, put in breaks, and have people from another country in an animation jumping up and down. Uh, let's see, um, Andre, regarding soft skills, how to ensure accountability, participation, and energy. Um, I think we covered it. If you want to cut, if you want to comment, please do. But I think we, we've been covering. Yeah, I wrote sometimes. a couple of articles on that, um, on Medium. Um, I again, I would love to talk about this, and I'm sorry for, for uh, you know, pushing uh, the time. I just don't want to uh, slow this down. How do you but do? I, I, sorry. Okay. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm. Now it's a race against Trump. the gif, the gif monsters. How do you draw? How do <laughs> yeah. you do drawing activities like Crazy Eight's three steps drawing while virtual? Okay. Uh, uh, this we for don't. Rise. Yeah, we we don't do them virtually because uh, in the sprint, Crazy Eight's uh, concept sketching are all individual exercises. As we mentioned before, we give that as a homework, as an offline exercise with clear instructions. Uh, we have everything, like all the instructions in our uh, remote design sprint template, which is in the resource library on the right. Done. Okay. Uh, Anna, how can we offer a memorable experience in a remote meeting or workshop? Yes. So one thing to remember here, people will always, always remember how you make them feel. Yeah. Uh, I'm not talking only about making them having fun or being relaxed or using energizers, but also keep in mind the outcome that you have to achieve. So make sure that you actually deliver on what you promised. 
and try to map out the experience of the whole session and try to figure out where and when you can insert certain moments to make them feel better or you know just uh, extraordinary <laughs> yeah book uh, recommendation here the power of moments read that book is going to help you design Absolutely. experiences not just in your work life but in your personal life as well power of moments what is the best agenda for remote design sprints? What are your tips? Uh, I don't know. I could do this in lightning round. The best agenda for remote designs, digital sprints is one that's open. Put your agenda, your proposed agenda out to the people that are there. They may not know everything, but that's going to prompt questions in terms of figuring out what they understand and don't understand about virtual sprints. And that starts with the bright conversation to have around what people are going to do and what they're signing up for. So I would say an open agenda is the best one. Um, and Andre, how might we support each other in leveling up skills for remote? Just do the things as often as you can every day, as much as possible, do retrospectives, uh, right after a workshop, like feel humble enough to confront yourself with your own mistakes and do a debrief with the whole team. And that's going to skyrocket you. Okay. Uh, Roz, what mural tricks do you have so cards are aligned? <clears throat> this is actually a Sandy question, but Roz probably knows the answer too. Yeah, uh, same thing in, in Miro. Uh, you just select them and you can arrange them in a grid, in a line, in a row. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep, there's so the sub, the sub uh, links can do that. Uh, <laughs> someone just said put audio volume mute. I have no idea why. Okay, I'll go for the, the one uh, beneath. Uh, so how okay. do you can you stop moving? Yeah. So oh. how do you get people up to speed with the required soft skills for facilitation? Uh, I guess there's no right answer here because everyone has a different learning curve. But what we do in our trainings, we always put them to practice. <laughs> so we couple people and then we try to we ask them to replicate on in-person exercise or short session into a remote one. How often do you talk while virtual facilitating? It really depends on the facilitator. I tend to talk a little bit more than usual if I sense that people can use the, the direction of the discussion. Other times, if I get the sense that if there's if I'm just basically blabbling on and not really providing any value, then I don't talk much at all. Mm -hmm. um, Andre, what are the best moments to use music and what kind? Uh, I have a playlist. I think, I'm not sure mm -hmm. if it's a link to here, um, but there's like sprint playlists from me, from Agent Smart. Uh, use chill music, use the music that you think makes you personally very productive and just watch people's reactions if you want to put together your own lists, uh, you know, uh, playlist. Uh, when is <clears throat> always when you do something, but you don't, uh, you don't have a conversation, you don't have an open discussion. So I think I do it every time there's a there's a writing down session, a how might we session. So every time when you feel it's, it's really awkward right now, that's when I put on music. Chill Hop on YouTube is also really good in terms of like a general series of music that yeah. you can use. Um, also, if you can look up any kind of like jazz, uh, like compilation, that should work as well. Excuse me one second. Alvin, you're gonna get a 30 minute penalty if you don't stop. You have to, you have to sit over there. <laughs> Got it? It's getting rough. Okay. <laughs> Uh, let's see. How do you create those these cool mural boards with colors, pictures, and texts? Well, I, I would defer you over to Sandy Lamb, who's the expert on making these. Uh, also, you can take a cue from some of the people at Mural if you're into that that whiteboarding tool. They have a lot of uh, templates that you can use to show, and they they literally show how they build them out, and you can take inspiration from those as well. Uh, Amelia uh, over at Mural is really, 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 really good at at doing. Um, uh, whiteboarding for mural and she actually has an article on how she does storytelling with that um, just a couple more Anna uh, what did did people do before design sprints and are some still doing it what did people do before smartphones uh, design thinking uh, are they still some uh, are some still doing it obviously <laughs> they do not exclude each other different frameworks different scopes yeah how to change the work culture of something how to change the work culture um, unless you're a CEO or you're in charge of leadership, that's where work culture changes. It starts at the top and it cascades down. Um, you're not going to change it if you're part of the, if you're part of the hive, if you're part of the company. You can change the work culture in your team, but that's pretty much your circle of influence with that. 
Mm -hmm. uh, do you put background music while they are writing sticky notes? No, I do not. I tend to like, I tend to find music being distracting for me personally. What are your top resources for learning how to facilitate remote workshops? I think there's plenty over in the resources section you can use from there. And I think that's gonna end it for at least this session. There is still a ton of questions over on the left-hand side we did not get to. So those could be potentially uh, avenues for articles and for follow-ups for this. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we're gonna, we're gonna put a cap on it for now. I'm gonna zoom out just to kind of show where everything is. Um, Beautiful. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, it's, uh, it's a testament to not only the people who joined, but just two hours of activity and concentrating on a particular subject. Um, Beautiful mess. My other audience here is waiting for me to help them out with Spelling City. So uh, <laughs> I'd like to thank both Raz and Anna and Andre and Sandy and me and everyone else for joining this remote facilitation best practices part two that we did today. Uh, we will be posting up to the list of people that actually signed up the link to the video as well as to the mural board. I'm sure if there's other resources we want people to know about, we'll also do that as well. Um, any parting words from anybody on the panel side that you want to let people know about or they want to say real fast? Yes, uh, there's a link to donate to the World Health Organization yourself. So we will uh, brand our promise. And for everyone that attended, we're basically going to add up the people who joined here and the ones on YouTube and place our, uh, our donation. If you have a few dollars lying around that you're, you're happy to kind of push in that direction, we highly encourage you to do so. And yeah, I think that's pretty much it. And thanks everyone for, thanks for joining. Everyone. It was amazing. Yeah, and, and to to, uh, to if you're on the mural now, you can double click right on that particular um, that uh, graphic that we've put up on the mural. So if you want to do that donation, you can do it directly from there. Um, I've also placed a link on the chat also. So yes, yeah, it's on the chat as well. So thank you very much for attending both on YouTube and in Zoom. We really appreciate all the support you guys gave us throughout the week as well as in the session here and really do appreciate the questions that you asked. Um, I think I speak for everybody when we say, uh, have yourself a great week, stay safe out there, stay isolated, wash your hands, spend time with your kids, even when they want your attention all the time and uh, stay safe out there and we'll talk to y'all later, okay? Everyone have a group. Thanks everyone. I'll stop sharing. Take care, bye-bye. Bye. Bye, thanks everyone. Bye-bye later. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>